Okay. Good. So, um, yeah, we started to talk about random matrices and uh, how they model uh, freeness in the limit if the size of the random matrix goes to infinity. So the first thing we did was to look on the Gaussian random matrices, the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So this is the nicest random matrices we have. And if, they, if the size of them goes to infinity, then such a sequence of Gaussian random matrices converts to a, a semi-circle distribution. So this means we have a very canonical model of a semi-circle by random matrices. Okay, then we saw that actually we can generalize this uh, for getting a model of freeness itself. So if instead of one Gaussian random matrix, we take a couple of them, and which are independent, and then in a limit, of course, each of them converges to a semicircle, uh, but the relation between them, the independence on the level of the random matrices, converges to the limit uh, to freeness. Also, we get a limit, a tuple of free semicircles. So this means we can also model uh, free, a tuple of free semicircles in the uh, in the random matrix. Okay, of course, but I mean, freeness is good, but of course, the distribution is still special, it's just semi-circular. So the question is can we do more? Or can we also model other distributions in the limit? And the first step uh, we took uh, is that actually uh, we can replace one of the Gaussian random matrices by an arbitrary matrix. So this means, for example, if I have two Gaussians, of course, they go to a, to a pair of three semi-circular, but actually, what we started last time was that we can replace one of the Gaussians by an arbitrary, by a deterministic matrix, also which means just any matrix without any randomness, and then actually we still have this asymptotic freeness. Okay. That, that's what we want to do first. So, I mean, we already did the main step, namely calculating uh, mixed moments in Gaussians, in Gaussian random matrices, and such a deterministic matrix for finite n. And again, we got a very nice formula, which then is easy to control uh, if n goes to infinity. So let me record this theorem that was the last thing which we proved last time. So this was the theorem. Um, so let me just recall the main statement. So what we have, we are looking on a tuple of independent series. So I call them in one up to the T. So, so the, those are independent. GUEN matrices. Also, this means they are n by n matrices. So n is fixed in this theorem. Of course, then we, the next theorem we will set n to infinity, but here it is fixed. And then, in addition, we also consider a deterministic matrix. Also, this means we have D, and this is just an ordinary n by n matrix uh, where the entries are just numbers. Uh, no random variables, but just numbers. So, this is a deterministic matrix. Uh, and then we calculated the mixed moments in the A's and the D's. Also, we have to look on products where we have alternatingly uh, A's and powers of D's. And the main formula, which we derived, was the following, so phi. So phi, of course, is the expectation and the trace. So, tensor product of the trace and expectation. We calculated this for one of the A's. Uh, of course, <coughs> a factor n, <coughs> which uh, contains. 
contain some information about the pi. Also, this was this term which we always get in this context. So it's a number of clocks or number of cycles of number pi. So the pairing <coughs> is considered as a permutation, and it is multiplied with this very special permutation, which is just a long shift, which just shifts every element by one, and this is the number of cycles of this permutation. And then we also set subtract one and m over two. Okay, so this is <coughs> yeah, this is the contribution of such pi's, but then of course for each such pi, we also get a contribution of these. And it turns out that actually this contribution is very nice, namely this is a contribution which only uh, uses information about the trace of powers of these. Yeah? Not about really single entries of the Ds, but really only the information uh, with which is our, which are our, our moments, namely the traces of powers. So what we get here is actually the trace, and it's actually the product of traces. Okay. Which product? The product uh, which is according to the cycles of pi gamma. Oh, so this is okay, the number of cycles. This is the same as this, so this is more or less the same as shows up here. And this means we take a product of traces and a trace for each of the cycles. Okay, and then uh, the trace is, of course, of the product of the Ds of, of Cycle, um, of course, we only use the Ds <coughs> which correspond to the cycle. We multiply them and then take the trace. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we proved last time. Yeah. And that was the main calculation. Yeah. Also, we used the Wick formula for those guys here, and then we are left with some summation of our products of entries of the D matrices. But the main point is to see that this product of the D matrices and the summation of all the indices really is a product of traces along the cycles of this guy. Okay. I mean, that's a very nice thing that we get really a very explicit and complete formula uh, for those mixed moments uh, which only involve the, the traces of the deeds. Okay, and now of course, and, and this is exactly the distribution of our deeds of the matrices. Good, and now of course we want to see what happens if uh, n goes to infinity, uh, so this is true for any for any n. Uh, so D of course here is an n by n matrix, uh, A is an n by n matrix. Now we send n to infinity, of course the A's is then just a sequence of, of the GU ENs, causing the material matrices, that is clear what happens to them. But of course for D, we now have to require uh, that we take a sequence which has a limit distribution. Uh, I mean with D we can choose arbitrary. Uh, so for each for each n, they can have any, any distribution as we like, but of course we should now, if we go to infinity, we should take a sequence where the distribution converges. And then we see that of course this converges also to something. So if we now want to make an asymptotic statement, statement in our context always means n goes to infinity, n is the size of the matrices, uh, and of course we need a limit for these. And of course, I mean, this formula is nice, but of course for finite n it's also complicated. Huh? So I mean, for finite n, there's no freeness here. But of course, it's important to get freeness, because instead of summing over all pairings, we sum over the non-crossing ones. Huh? If n goes to infinity, then this term really uh, singles out the non-crossing so for finite n, even though we have an explicit formula, this is a complicated formula and it's maybe not so useful. It only really gets useful in the limit, because then we see that we have freeness about it. And freeness is something we can deal with and calculate. Okay, so but of course for such an asymptotic statement, we need of course that the D's which we consider in there is indicated <coughs> we have for each n we have such a matrix uh, such that those have a limit. Have a limit. Of course, in this 
distribution. The distribution is the only thing we care about. Okay, so this means that there are moments in the conversion. Uh, we have a limit in distribution. This means we have to assume uh, dn converges a distribution to some, let's say, uh, yeah, random variable little d distribution, which of course just means uh, the limit of the normalized trace of, let's say, the nth power of our matrix d has a limit, and this is phi t to the end. Okay. goes to infinity for our statement here is of course that this limit exists and then you can define this abstract element by saying this is a guy which has exactly this limit and these moments. Good. Okay, and of course if a trace of a power of d converges, then of course also those expressions converges because those are just the products of traces of powers. So each trace of a power converges, so this guy also converges. And of course, it converges to the corresponding object in the T's. So if you assume this, this implies um, also this expression shown up there, which is so this also has a limit, so it's the limit of this expression which raise um, i of the power q1 of d up to the power q m of d that this goes to the corresponding expression in terms of the d's also which then of course I write as phi pi gamma of d q1 up to d This notation is the same as here, so this is the product of phi's applied to the product of the d's, and I have the product according to the cycles of this. And then I, for each cycle, I apply phi to the product of the d's, which are indexed by the elements of this cycle. Good, okay, so we have this, and then of course, yeah, now it's, we know then what happens with this. And this tells us, actually, so this gives us a formula in the limit for this mixed moment. And then the only thing which we still have to observe that this formula actually characterizes the freeness in the limit between the t's and the a's. Oh, okay, so let's um, let us collect our statement. The next theorem. So maybe work is done. You only have to, have to see that really you get freeness in the limit, which might not be at, yeah, yeah, at the beginning. But I mean, we have enough. We already have enough tools for seeing this. Okay, but so let me state. So for each n, uh, for each n, n, so each natural number, so we consider uh, a by n up to a t n. Those are t dependent Gaussian n times n random matrices. So this will be t independent. Uh, Okay, and then in addition, I take the dn, which is an n by n matrix. Oh, okay. I just take the same as before, but I do it for each n. Uh, so this dn should be a deterministic n times n matrix. And now, of course, I have to make my assumption that the d's are not arbitrary, but there is a connection between the various n, and if n goes to infinity, they should converge to something, they should have a limit in distribution. <laughs> so I assume such that the n converges in distribution to an element e, and this e just lives somewhere in some uh, star probability space. Some, in some, let's say, start 
not really important then. Because they lose all many information, it's just about the moments of those kinds, distribution. Okay. And then, of course, we have um, the limit uh, of our Gaussian random matrices is then given as the limit of those formulas. So we just write down. Formula, so then we have for the, from the same assumptions as we have here for all n, also we want to multiply m a's and d's, and we have to choose indices in all possibilities for let's say the powers of these if you want to m, those are n zero, which means the power of the zero, which allows us that we don't have to take powers of, of the A's, but we can just, uh, I mean, if one of the D's is, is, if one of the powers is zero, then D to the zero is one, and then I, mean, I can also have powers of the A's. Good, okay, so this is N zero, and for all choices of the indices of my Gaussian random matrices, so for all P's, which are between one and T. One. Okay, so for all such choices, we have that the limit n more than infinity of the phi, and this is of course the expectation of the trace of our product of a n d1, d n q1 multiplied and so on. Okay, such that this limit is given by a nice formula, the limit of this. So we are summing over a priori pairings, but then of course, if I'm taking the limit n goes to infinity, then this guy here goes either to 0 or 1, and it goes to 0 if my pairing is a crossing pairing, and it goes to 1 if this is not possible. Also, this means this term and limit has the effect that the summation over all pairings actually is only exactly a summation over non positive pairings. So I get here the sum of the non positive pairings of n elements. And of course, I still have this condition that this pairing, this non positive pairing, must res res respect uh, the indices of the A's. So pi must be smaller than the kernel of P. Okay, and for each. Each such, such pairing makes a contribution. Okay, and this contribution we already have taken care of, so we just get the limit of this, but this is now just the corresponding phi expression. So what I get here is phi of pi gamma d to the q1 to d to the q1. Oh, okay, so this is now our main formula, let me call it star. Okay, so this tells us how to calculate the mixed moments in the limit, but now I also claim that this actually is a formula which tells me uh, that, uh, that the d's uh, and the s in the limit are free. Oh, so this is also still part of the theorem, and that's, that's the only thing we still have to see. So I'm claiming that this formula tells me Actually, if I'm taking my matrices which I have, my T Gaussian random matrices, and then I also have this uh, one deterministic matrix, they all together in distribution converge to a couple of, of free semicirculars, <coughs> and then also an element which is also free. I mean that uh, just the Gaussian guys converge to a couple of free semicirculars, that's what we saw before. But now we include a D, and the point is that this D is now also free from those guys. So we have here S1 up to ST a semicircular, each of them a semicircular, and 
free, but they are also free you are able to give to all of those things are free. Okay, so that, that's the statement of the theorem. And that's the thing which we still have to see. Yeah? That this formula really means this. Okay, so let us prove this. Okay, so, so I mean this formula is clear. Huh? And this is just taking the limit uh, of this formula. Formula. Well, slide here. This follows from our expression for finite n. The theorem is applied to this one. Uh, since uh, we know that everything converges now, also so we have the trace of. Gamma, this argument converges to the corresponding phi expression the D's. So here I have the capital D's is converges to the phi I gamma of the corresponding argument. And of course here I have the D, and here I have the D ends, and here I have the D's there. Yeah. And we also know that the limit of this power of n, the limit of n to the number of cycles of gamma pi minus 1 minus m over 2 singles out exactly the non crossing pairs. So I have to see the limit of this 
moment is exactly this one. Where it has and these are few. Okay, now let us see how to calculate such a moment using the fact I mean, such a moment in terms of the moments of the D's. Because that's what this complex temperature is. <coughs> and so in order to do this, yeah, we use the moment cumulant formula. Yeah, so this is now a question of free probability. There's nothing to do anymore uh, with matrices. It's just a question how do I calculate such a mixed moment in variables where the S's are free semicirculars and then I have a D which is also free. But the D otherwise can be as arbitrary as And this, this mixed moment must be, uh, must be given in terms of the moments of the D's. And what is this formula? To get this, we use the moment cumulant formula. And it's good to use cumulants because for the S's, the cumulants are easy. Okay, so this is the sum over all non-crossing partitions of two m elements. I mean, I'm multiplying here two m factors. I mean, d to the power is just one term, I'm not splitting this in the equal So I'm just multiplying here two m terms. Okay, so then the moment of this is given by summing over non-crossing partitions, and then I get a cumulant for each of those partitions, and I take the cumulant of those arguments. So I take here as p1, comma, q1, comma, s2, comma, d2, q2, comma, and so on, up to s, pm, d2, q2. Okay, so this is just the moment cumulant formula. I take the cumulant of all those. But now, of course, I know something about my entries. So first of all, I know that the S's and the D's are free. So this means the sigma cannot connect S with D. Because mixed cumulants vanish for free value. Also, this means uh, this S here actually splits into blocks which only connect the S's. And it splits into blocks which only connect the D's. But there are no other guys. Huh? So actually, I have here two pairings, one uh, two partitions, uh, one for the S's and one for the D's. Good. Okay. And so what I get then, of course, is the sum over let's say pi. Yeah. So I say the sigma decomposes into blocks which connect the S's. Those blocks I connect to a partition which I call pi, and then I have blocks which connect the D's. And those, those blocks I, I collect into a partition which I call a pi trivial. Okay. The summation here of a sigma is then actually a summation of pi and pi trivial. Okay. So let me here first do the sum, summation of pi. And for this, I get the contribution, I get then the, the, the product of the cumulants from the blocks of the S's. And this is, of course, the kappa pi. And then I also now do the summation over uh, the blocks for the D's. And of course, I can first do the summation over the pi's. For a fixed pi, I get this contribution. And then I'm summing over all pi twiddle, which are compatible with this. So I'm summing over pi twiddle, uh, which is a non crossing partition of m elements. I mean, they are only connecting m elements. So sigma connects two m elements, pi connects the m s's, and pi further connects the m d's. Okay. And for those, I get here the contribution kappa pi twiddle of d q1 to d q n. Good. Okay, but of course, I mean. I have to sum over pi twiddle such that pi and pi twiddle together are my sigma, my non crossing partition. So, I mean, this means that pi twiddle must not only be a non crossing partition for itself, but together with pi it must be non crossing. So, I mean, uh, so, if I have fixed pi, then this means I'm allowed here to sum over pi twiddle such that pi and pi twiddle taken together in the form, in this ordinary way, uh, must be a non crossing partition. Good. Okay, but now we can observe a few things. First of all, this formula, using this formula, is very good if I have the S's here, because for the S's, the cumulants are very similar. 
I mean, namely for the S's, uh, for a semicircular element, only the second cumulant is equal to 1. Which means that actually I'm summing here not over all non-crossing partitions, but only over parents. So, because this thing here, this is 1, if pi is actually a non-crossing pairing, and actually because I have different S's here, uh, which are free, I must, hold my, I must also respect the P. So actually, I also think that the kernel of pi of P is bigger than pi. Okay. Otherwise, it is so. Uh, so this means the summation here is actually the summation over non-crossing pairings. Not the number of partitions, but non-crossing pairings, and they must also satisfy this that the kernel of P is bigger than pi. Oh, and now you, you already see that we are not so far away from it. Okay, so this means here I'm, I'm just summing over one crossing pairings. Uh, the cumulants of, this, of the semicirculars just make the contribution one for those. So I'm just left with this sum here. Yeah? And now here, so if I'm fixing a pi here, I'm summing over pi fiddle, which has this property, but this hopefully reminds you of uh, something which we did before. So namely this is actually condition of the Traverse complement. Huh? So, so we, had a, we had this mapping on the non-crossing partitions, the complement, Traverse complement, uh, which is given exactly by doing this. I mean, you, you have your endpoints, the non-crossing partition of this, uh, and then you take the complement by looking at the points which are still in between and you, you take the maximal non-crossing partition which you can do here uh, without having crossing with the original one. Uh, and of course I mean having alternating the guys goes exactly with this. Uh, and this pi this pi twiddle is exactly the situation. The pi is, is a partition of this and the pi twiddle is a partition of this. Uh, and saying that pi and pi twiddle is together one crossing is the same as saying middle is less than the Traveras complement of pi. Well, the Traveras complement of pi is exactly the maximal non-crossing partition which has this property here. And then we are just summing the walls to one another. Because then they automatically satisfy this. Good. So this means this summation here actually is a summation over pi middle which are less than the complement. But then I'm summing here cumulants index by pi twiddle over pi twiddles which are less than something. But summing cumulants gives me moments. So this means what I'm getting here are actually the moments of this guy. Okay, so. Then I multiply this gamma, 
and then I have something in the permutation. We are not going back again to the, uh, to the partitions. No? But here we suggested actually maybe we should do this. And what we get in the permutation group actually can be seen also as a non crossing partition. And it should be the Prevera's component. And this is in, indeed true. And maybe instead of proving this abstractly, maybe we just look on the sum just to see that this really uh, fits. <laughs> okay. Say is what we get here is actually the formula star. Three, what happens to three? Three goes to four, and gamma. 
and 4 goes to 5. Five. Go to five. Then 5 goes to 6, and 6 goes to 3. So we have a
course, I mean, uh, we have here guys which are free in the limit, so we can also look on the sum of them. And of course, note that for getting non trivial ones, I mean, we need to D. Of course, I mean, before we also had in the limit, we had A1 and A2. In the limit, they were also free, but if I take the sum of them, this is nothing exciting because the sum of two independent GUEs is just again a GUE. The sum of two free semicircles is just another semicircle of a different variance, but it's the same. No? So, I mean, there's no need of calculating uh, the distribution of A1 plus A2 because you already know what it is. Okay, so, so you should know if you only have 1000 random matrices, then of course we could look on A1 plus A2. Dn converges to S plus D. 
Okay, but this means that the limiting eigenvalue distribution of this is given by the distribution of this. But this distribution is now a free convolution of this and this. Thus, the limiting eigenvalue distribution, I mean what we are doing here is really taking the average limiting eigenvalue distribution, but I told you all these theorems are also true in a more sure sense. Oh, so, um, and what we have proved here is the average. Maybe in particular, if you do complete calculations that you're looking on eigenvalue histograms of random matrices, maybe it's more impressive if you do it almost surely. Uh, so, this limiting. given by the semicircle, and that's the distribution of S, uh, and plus the free convolution of mu d. Right? Mu d you can describe as you like. Oh, sorry, no. Can you use, uh... Okay, in such distributions, I can relate it also in classical random matrix theory. No? So I mean, you can also do it directly without using free probability, but free probability gives you a very conceptual way for doing things like this. And in particular, you can generalize it to much more general situations, no? which are very, maybe hard to address directly. Good. Okay. Um, let me say as a second example, maybe we can observe a little bit more. Right? So, I mean, this, this here, some of you say, hey, okay, what we can do here is a limit, we can model a semicircle and something arbitrary, which are free by random matrices. <laughs> but actually, if you look a little bit closer on what we did here, actually, we can do a bit more. So, namely, uh, when I calculated the mixed moments of my random matrices, so I, took, I took powers of the Ds. But actually, I mean, this e to the q1, this was just any, any matrix, and it's not really important that I had here powers of the same matrix. So actually, I could just say I have here a matrix, I have here another matrix, and here another matrix. Also, actually, I could choose the d's also uh, as arbitrary matrices. No? I mean, in the group, it never showed up that those are really the powers of some, some, uh, some d. It were just matrices that we gave names to, to the edges. So, so actually what we have done here is a little bit more general. So they so note the recording the proof of our theorem is 14 with powers of these which appear there in our mixed moment. Not really need to be powers of one deterministic matrix T, but we can choose actually there, we can choose arbitrary matrices, M arbitrary matrices. Well, the other that we call E 
here. Okay. And then, I mean, what <coughs> we are actually I mean, you know, not alternatively, but I mean, some, some of the guys here are powers of D, and some of the guys are powers of E. No? So this is all, all mixed moments in the A's, and the D's, and the E's. No? And then we get the same formula as before, and what we actually see then is that if my pair of deterministic matrices has a limit distribution, then I also get a limit distribution of of taking those deterministic matrices together with the Gaussian matrices. Okay, so then, under the assumption that my pair of EN and EN converges, we get also an asymptotic freeness statement about them with respect to the Gaussian matrices. So let me only take one of them this now. Okay, so then under the assumption that the pair EN EN Something which is not only totally arbitrary, but the D can be chosen arbitrarily. 
Uh, so this means this is now not just a semi-circle distribution, but we have more flexibility here. Uh, so uh, random matrix language. So what we see here is that so I mean this of course is the limit of a n p n a n so that this taken together with e n converges of course this converges to a to s to s and this converges to my e and according to what we have seen there those guys are free okay. so this means we can uh, also model more general freeness situations by random matrices. Again, we are not absolute. It's not that we can prescribe any distribution for this because this is now again this is something special. Those are variables which are a special special type, but we also saw before. Those are actually uh, special compound possible distributions, which we also had in some of our. Science. Yeah, so let me do this. Okay, so I mean the end. Uh, <laughs> the final question. So can we also 
also model arbitrary plus v2 via random matrices. And it turns out that we actually we can do this, but we should not use Gaussian random matrices, but we should use unitary random matrices. No? Because you see, what you get from here is that if, I, mean, if I can decan the arbitrary, and then to make things free, I have to conjugate it by a Gaussian random matrix. Okay, but the Gaussian random matrix, if I apply this, of course, changes the distribution. The distribution of this is not the distribution of D anymore, but something calculated from this. So if you could do a similar thing, where you replace the S by something, which makes things free in a limit, but does not change the distribution to D itself, then of course this would be very good. And of course it's unitary matrices which don't change the distribution. Uh, because our distribution is given by moments, and if I do a conjugation by unitary matrices, I'm not changing uh, the moments, I'm not changing the traces. Okay. That, that's the reason that we should now look for unitary matrices. Uh, we have to use unitary random matrices. And if you can show that also unitary Gaussian random matrices become free in the limit from deterministic matrices, we can do the same as here, and then here we have unitary ones. And then we can prescribe the D as we like, and, and by the D here does not change anything on its distribution, it just makes this and this free. Good, okay, and so that's the next chapter, actually which really gives us the full power of random matrices in the free probability context, namely that we also have the, the unitary that you also have the freeness for unitary random matrices. But of course I have now to tell you more specifically uh, what are unitary random matrices. So this means of course I can take unitary matrices, but I have to put some distribution on them. I have to specify what is the distribution of the entries, what do I mean with unitary random matrices. And more specifically, so we are using a high unitary random matrices because we are using a kind of hard measure on the on the unitary matrices. So this should just be the set of 
unitary in my n matrices. Good. Okay. And then, of course, this un is now a group. Well, this has a nice with respect to multiplication. With respect to matrix multiplication, the product of two unitary matrices is again a unitary matrix. So this actually is a group. It's, it's a compact group. Um, and yeah, this means there exists a Haar measure. Yeah? Okay, so this is the, yeah, the side from uh, SP. Theory, so compact groups have, have a specific measure of them. I mean, it's, 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 it's a topological it's group, so we can talk about measures with respect to the sigma algebra generally by what we said, so something like this. Uh, and so there's a specific measure which is somehow the replaced. The, the analog of the Lebesgue measure. Yeah, I mean, R is also, or the compact, or locally compact, is also a, a nice group, uh, and it has a specific measure, the Lebesgue measure is somehow special among all the measures on R because it has the property that it is invariant under shifting, right? It's invariant under group operation. Yeah? Okay. And the same is true on any, on any locally compact group, or in particular on compact groups, we have a Haar measure which is invariant under shifting by group operation. Uh, so it is the analog of the Lebesgue measure. Uh, okay. So any any compact group has this, in particular the group for the UN. So then N is of course the suspect matrix multiplication. Multiplication. measure 
we call it. Now you need to have your random matrices. Okay, that's the random matrices we want to consider. Well, that's the replacement of the Gaussian random matrices. <laughs> okay, and maybe let me also make a definition. Uh, I mean, of course, this is now a measure on the set of matrices. No? So this measure contains all information about all the entries of my matrices. No? Like in the Gaussian case. No? I mean, you, you specify the distribution of all the entries. This also specifies the distribution of all entries, but in an abstract way. I mean, at the moment, we have no idea what this really is. And we have to understand this a little bit more. But of course, I mean, if we are talking now about the distribution of such a guy, then we are just looking for the trace and the average that goes back to this. And the question is, so what, what is such a guy abstractly? And it turns out that this is something which we also already had, at least in some assignment, namely this is a high material element. So let me also make the definition here. What is this? So this is unitary. matrix and a deterministic matrix, I want to calculate a moment, 
which means I get a big formula which involves entries of the use. And for this I have to take the expectation. And in the Gaussian case, this was the big formula which told us uh, what, what this is. So now we need a similar formula which tells me how can I calculate, or at least how get, can I deal with uh, expectations of entries of such a high unitary value matrix. Okay, this is not true with the right? It's not as nice as in the Gaussian case, it's not so explicit, but in principle, again, there is a yeah, there's a structural formula there which tells us how to reduce any mixed moment of such guys to some specific information, which is usually called the Weingarten function in this context. So let me introduce this. So let us first introduce this. I mean, the Weingarten function is somehow like uh, the covariance for the Gaussian guys. So this is more complex information, so namely for each. Permutation in the permutation group SM and for each N, or for, let's say for each N, which is bigger than M, we use the following notation WG, so this stands for Weingarten, and it depends on N and alpha. And what this is, so this is an expectation of a very specific product of entries of my matrix. That's somehow the basic. Uh, information which I need. So this is the information. And so my my, uh, my my u of course so u I write as u and j. So this is a, is a high unitary random matrix. Uh, so this has entries u i j uh, which are just uh, some classical random variables and I have to specify what is the distribution of them. And so this means I have to take joint moments. So this means u has the entries u, and I also need the star moment. So I take the u star, and then I get here the complex conjugate. So I have to multiply u's and u bars. Oh, okay. And so here I multiply, let's say I multiply m of the u's, but I'm only taking specific entries. So namely I take the 1 1 entry, uh, multiply this to the 2 entry up to the U M M entry. Okay. Um, yeah. So you see M is less than N, so I have at least a little different views. So that's the reason why I choose this. And then I multiply it with the conjugate, with the U bar. And for the U bar, I also take the first the first index is 1, 2, 3 up to M, but the second index now can be a permutation of 1 up to M. This permutation is given by alpha. So I take here the U bar, so I take 1. But then I have here alpha and u bar 2, alpha 2, and so on, up to u bar m alpha. Oh, okay. So this is the definition. Oh, okay. So I mean, I'm not saying I know what it is because it's, it's not very simple, but I give a name to it, and this name is this here. Oh, so why not? Because it depends on a and alpha. Okay, so. Those are very specific moments of the entries of my matrix. So where the u here is uh, I unitary and times n random matrix. As I already said, we call this W G uh, the binary.
that uh, is, I'm just giving you the facts which you're going to use. There are two, two things uh, which, we, which we need. I mean, one thing is that this Weingarten function is somehow uh, a special kind of information about moments of the use. And in analogy with the Gaussian case, you should think of this, that this is like the information which we had there for the covariance. No? And the covariance was only the second moment. No? And here, of course, this is more moments. It's not just second moments, it's more. But, but for very specific choice of indices. No? And the point is that this is the basic block, so if I know this, then I can calculate all other moments. No? So there is a, is a formula which is and this uh, philosophically like a big formula which tells us how I can calculate any moment in the in entries if I know this one. Okay. And then, of course, what I also need is the asymptotic behavior of this in n. I mean, for the covariance, we just said uh, the covariance was going with 1 over n huh? for each block. For each and here, of course, I mean, uh, we are not free to describe this, but this is something, and so we need this information about the asymptotic behavior of the right line function in n. No? And I mean, that's the two facts which I'm going to give you, but maybe I, I do this next time. No? Uh, so, 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 this is exactly the ingredients which we will need for doing our calculation for, for the joint moments in uh, deterministic and unitary matrices <coughs> and for understanding the asymptotic behavior. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, but so I think I will leave it like this. And, Next time I will give you the precise statements. No? But you have to have the idea the Weingarten function is the, maybe like the, the covariance for the Gaussian ones. And then we have a big formula which tells us how, if I know this, how I can calculate everything else. And then I also have some information about how this behaves asymptotically in A, no? which allows me to, uh, yeah, to see the, the limit in almost infinity of the formulas which you are going to derive. But, but that's. Enough for today.